Good evening, friends. I'm Steve Benoon. You're watching Israeli News Live, also Danoon Institute of Biblical Research. And I got this uh, sent to me by a good friend of mine, Gary Lowry. Uh, this article here, May 14th, 2020, Netanyahu refuses to divulge a secret agreement with Jordan over the Temple Mount. Now, <clears throat> it's not so much the fact of a secret agreement. Uh, it's the fact that Every time I see Breaking Israel News putting out an article, there's, of course, always the biblical passages that they like to put on there as well. And if you'll notice, like in this case of this one here, the presence of Hashem, as they put on there, the presence of the Lord, entered the temple by the gate that faced eastward, Ezekiel 43, 4. And you can look at many articles. Uh, this one here on May 14th uh, of 2019, Evangelical and Latin American faith leaders gather in Israel's Knesset. Uh, they're quoting Isaiah 2.3. In fact, uh, just the other day I dealt with a video on that, uh, speaking of another uh, very well-known prominent uh, evangelical pastor <clears throat> who spoke about uh, Isaiah 2.3. And of course, pictured in the, in the picture here on this one is none other than Yehuda Glick. And uh, Isaiah 2, 3, And the many people shall go and say, Come, let us go up to the mount of Hashem, or the mountain of the Lord, to the house of God of Yaakov, uh, and he may instruct us in his ways, and that we may walk in his paths, for instruction shall come forth from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Isaiah 2, 3. <clears throat> Another scripture that's already been fulfilled. But yet, over and over and over, and I, these are only chosen because I'm going to be speaking about uh, these issues anyway. Uh, this one here on June 19th of 2019, so it's been, uh, you know, a little over, almost a year ago. Uh, they quote here Zechariah 8, 19, and, and this here is uh, dealing with evangelical, uh, <clears throat> well, I shouldn't say just this one here. The last two here are dealing with the evangelical faithful that are, that are uh, forging relationships with the state of Israel, with the Orthodox community, and I just find it interesting that it always comes on the heel of scriptures that are obviously fulfilled, but yet the evangelical, the messianic community, nobody seems to realize that. Uh, new initiative launched to establish a Christian uh, ninth of Av. Tish B'Av is spoken about in the Hebrew language. And this is in regards to getting Christians to repent uh, for the destruction of the temple of 70 AD, something that Jesus actually prophesied of. Zechariah 8, 19, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the fast of the fourth month, the fast of the fifth month, the fast of the seventh month, and the fast of the tenth month, shall become occasions for joy and gladness, happy festivals for the house of Judah. But you must love honesty and integrity. Wow. And yet, it's another passage that's been fulfilled and everybody is still looking at this as something to be uh, taking place in the future so I'm going to go into this with you here and uh, so we're going to get started here in just a few moments here we're going to start we're going back to this first article Ezekiel 43 and that's where we're going to begin momentarily so if we turn uh, over to Ezekiel 43 beginning with verse 4 where they actually quote in this article here and the glory of the Lord came into the house by the way of the gate whose prospect is toward the east. And a, spirit, and, and a spirit took me up and brought me into the inner court. And behold, the glory of the Lord filled the house. And I heard one speaking unto me out of the house. And a man stood by me and he said unto me, Son of man, this is the place of my throne and the place of the soles of my feet where I dwell in the midst of the children of Israel forever. And the house of Israel shall no more defile my holy name. This is a scripture that has been fulfilled 2,000 years ago. And, and I really, those of you that are, that are Jewish, those of you that are rabbis that might listen to this broadcast or just Jewish uh, people that are listening in today, I encourage you to really examine these prophecies as I share them with you. And on this here, I have highlighted for you in the Hebrew language uh, the very part where it talks about, and I will dwell in the midst of the children for, uh, of Israel forever. Okay? And specifically, betok b'nei in the midst. 
He was literally speaking about dwelling inside of the human heart. And I am amazed at how easily this goes right over the head of Christians, Christian ministers, especially Christian ministers, people that are supposed to know the Bible, and it goes right over their heads. Uh, if we look at uh, these other passages that are being quoted, Isaiah 2-3, we're going to go into that in a little bit, as well as Zechariah 8-19, both of these being put as future fulfillments, and yet they are already fulfilled. Uh, and we just did the one on Isaiah 2-3, so I won't go too deep into that other than the article itself. There is a reason for that. Now, I, I want to share with you, let's look at the book of Hebrews and I'll tell you something, I have been more than a week just on chapter 10. I could not get beyond chapter 10 of the book of Hebrews for some reason. And I finally fell out, figured out why just the other day. And this is one of the reasons why I wanted to make the video. And as I was getting ready to make the video, I, I uh, hadn't looked at my phone in some time. And I'd gotten a text from Brother Gary Lowry about uh, this thing about the temple. And then I noticed the scripture and I thought how fitting uh, this message would be just on that issue alone. Uh, let's just begin in verse 1. For the law having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. So no matter how much we had the law, it could not make the worshiper perfect. For then would they not have ceased to be offered because that the worshippers once purged should have no more conscience of sin. But in those they have italicized sacrifices. They assume you know that that should be there. But in those sacrifices, there is a, remem a remembrance again made of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, thou hast had no pleasure. Then said I, Lo, I come in the volume of the book, it is written of me, to do thy will, O God. Now he's quoting from the book of Psalms, chapter 40. Sacrifice and meal offering, that's no delight in. Mine ears hast thou opened. Burnt offering and sin offering hast thou not required. Then said I, Lo, I come with the roll of a book which is prescribed for me. I delight to do thy will. O my God, yea, the law is in my in most parts. Right there. Look at that. Betoch me'ai. It's in my innermost parts. Exactly what we find in Ezekiel 43 as well. I will dwell in the midst of the children of Israel forever. Betoch b'nei Yisrael le'olam. How is the living God going to dwell within his own people? unless the very life that was in Christ be released back upon the people. And I say that, I, I, what I'd like to share with you, just so you know where we're coming from on this, uh, Genesis chapter 2. In Genesis, if we scroll down, uh, chapter 2, make sure we're in ch yeah, chapter 2 here. The Lord formed man out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. And we look at that scripture right there, what's really important is this part right here in Hebrew. Ipak bepa'av nishmar chayim. The chayim is what's really important, and I'll highlight that in blue for you there, or dark blue. The chayim is God's own life. That's his life. And if you notice, how did he do it? Ipak bepa'av. He breathed in his nostrils. If you remember, after the resurrection, Jesus Christ breathed upon his apostles and, and said to them, Receive ye the gift of the Holy Ghost. He was showing that he was the same God that breathed in the nostrils of Adam that breath of life that he was that same one.
Just like when he took the, the clay and he spit on the ground, he formed it and made it and put it on the blind man's eyes, told him to go wash in the pool of Siloam. He was showing that he was the same God that could form man from the dust of the earth. That's why when we look at these passages, like in Isaiah 43, and we see in verse 4, and the glory of Ukavod Yehovah, we see that the glory of Yahweh, Jehovah, whatever you want to call that name there, that is literally referring to Jesus Christ. He would be the one. He would actually, come, as he said, I come in my Father's name and you receive me not. Okay, so let's go into the book of Hebrews. And, and keep in mind, this one here in Genesis, that life that he breathed inside of Adam was the same life that was inside of Jesus Christ when he died on the cross. And it's also interesting because he breathed in the Chaim, a plural form of the life of Almighty God. But Adam himself was Lenefesh Chaya. He was a living soul, a singular, not chayim, but a singular. But why is there plural breathed into Adam's nostrils? Well, because God formed man et ha'adam, which basically was humankind because both Adam and Eve were in that exact same body. Later, he puts Adam into a deep sleep room and takes Eve from him. Uh, and... This is why there had to be that plural form of that life breathed in him. And also Jesus being a second Adam, he would have all the life within him. And of course, because of the fall in the garden, which separated man from, from their God, by the life of God, that tree of life, which by the way, some argue that, oh, well, that's not the tree, you know, <clears throat> they never got to eat of the tree of life. That's not true. Uh, the tree of life fruit was given right to them because you have to look at what it says in verse 9. In fact, it says it here clearly. Well, actually, let me back up just a minute here. Uh, here we go. Here we go right here. All right. It's ve'etz hachayim. The tree of life. What was breathed in the nostrils of Adam? What was breathed in him was the Chaim, that little part there I've done in dark blue for you highlighted, the Chaim was breathed within him. So if the tree of life bears the Chaim and it was breathed into his nostrils up here, Chaim, then what do we have? Let me, let me put these in yellow, just those two little points right there. Right? Because you need to be, I want you to really be able to see this on your screen as well. Right? The Chaim. The fruit of the tree of life is life itself. And the Chaim was breathed into the nostrils of Adam and he became a living soul. Ipak Be'apav Nishmar Chaim. All right? And now we see that that tree of life is there and it's in the Beto Chagan. That's another interesting aspect right there. Where is it? Of course, now both the trees are in the Beto Chagan. All right? They're both in the middle of the Garden of Eden. The, uh, we had the Kol Es Nechmad Le More, okay? Vetov Le Ochel, okay? They're told that they can, uh, you know, you can, you can well, let, me, let me just back up. The tree of life also in the midst of the garden and the tree of knowledge of good and evil, all right? Now, I find this rather interesting, and I've never really picked up on this before. I'll just share this with you. It specifically, we see the tree of life, excuse me, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden. Then we get a comma, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. We assume that the tree of knowledge of good and evil is in the midst of the garden as well, but the question is, is it? We don't know for sure. Uh, because there is a comma and then and as a conjunction and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Could that be an allegory as well as my thought? All right, the betoch, okay, the betoch agan. And the reason I say that is because when we're looking over here in Ezekiel 43, um, was it Ezekiel 43 that we saw this earlier? Yes, here we go right here. Betoch bene Yisrael, okay. And what do we have on that? That is in the midst 
of Israel, a prophecy, the place of the soles of my feet where I will dwell in the midst of the children of Israel forever. I really believe that when he's talking about dwelling in the midst of Israel, which Israel has a compound fulfillment. It's not just the, the, the people of the house of Judah 2,000 years ago. It was the people of the house of Judah, the people of the house of Israel, and the Gentiles that would believe upon the name of Jesus Christ as their Messiah. They are all Israel. They are grafted into that olive tree. The wild olive tree is grafted into it. And so by faith in Jesus Christ, they become one with him. And then what do you have? You have God dwelling in the midst. Just like it was in Genesis at the beginning. He's in the midst. Right? The tree of life is where? It's in the Betel Chagan, in the midst of the garden. And again, that's an allegory. It's not that it's in the midst of them at the time, but we see that that chayim, that fruit, ends up in the middle of or inside the very body of Adam and himself. And, of course, we never see, never do you see that Eve has to be blown into her nostrils after she's formed. Why? She received it when she was inside of Adam. The life of God was inside of her. The type of that in the New Testament is John the Baptist. We know that he received the gift of the Holy Spirit from his mother's womb. He was already in his mother's womb and got the Holy Spirit. There it is. He is a type of Eve. He is a type of the church, the firstborn of the believers. So he didn't have to receive the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. He'd already received it in his mother's womb. I just find those things interesting. All right, let's get into the book of Hebrews. For, for it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. Wherefore, when he come into the world, he says, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. And burnt offering sacrifice of sin has had no pleasure. Then said I, Lo, I come in the volume of the book, it is written of me to do thy will, O God. And as I mentioned already, Psalm chapter 40. Above when he said, Sacrifice and burnt offerings, and offering for sin thou wouldest not, neither has pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. I mean, that just blows me away. The writer of the book of Hebrews notes that specifically that God is saying he didn't have any, he didn't have pleasure in them, even though it's, it is actually offered by the law. It's a commandment of the Mosaic law or Levitical law that was given to the children of Israel to actually carry out a custom, but he didn't delight in it. Why doesn't he delight in it? It wasn't the perfect will of Almighty God. His perfect will would come later when Christ came. When he would become the mediator between God and man. Verse 9, Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first that he may establish the second. And we don't have time to go back into this, but if you remember, I, I did a teaching not long ago on, I think, Hebrews chapter 7, 8, 9, and we were talking about the Melchizedek priesthood. And clearly, as we see from the scripture and the writer of the New Testament, uh, or the writers of the New Testament, that there was another priesthood coming. And if it was, if the Levitical priesthood, or it was, if that was to be a perfect priesthood, then what need did we have of the Melchizedek priesthood, which Christ was of that lineage? And not that he was, it's a royal seed, okay? A royal priesthood. But that's why there had to be, and, and that's all we're doing. We get, by the time we get down to Hebrews chapter 10, we're seeing why the law, the Levitical law, has to be done away with. And I know a lot of people don't like to hear that because people are so much into law. They want to keep law, keep custom, keep tradition, you know, unless you enter into Christ, you're not going to keep the law. Unless you truly come into Him, you can't keep Sabbath. You can, you can practice Saturday all day long, every day, every week. You can keep it every single, everything you want to do, Levitical. You can go and you can wash the pots, and the, or not wash the pots of man, but you can wash your hands. You can do all the, the rituals of, of, uh, of Shabbat. 
that are under Levitical laws, not pick up anything, don't turn on the lights, which have the Gentile do it, which is such a hypo hypocrisy for Jewish people to have uh, Gentiles turn on the light. Uh, believe me, I was a Chabad Jew. I can remember the times. I, I'll never forget. Over in Europe, in fact, we're with the Jewish friends there, and, and sure enough, somebody forgot to turn on the light before the Shabbat began, and they're freaking out because they need to be able to study Torah, and that's a nice thing, but they, nobody would turn on the light. <laughs> Just flick the switch. That's not breaking the Sabbath. But no, let's go find a Gentile. I told him I'll turn the switch on. Steve, you can't, you're Jewish. Oh, let's get a Gentile to break the covenant, right? Well, to begin with, that's not the covenant any longer. When you are in Christ, you have ceased from your works. And you have entered into his rest. As the scripture said, there remaineth a Sabbath of rest to the people. I need to really teach on that separately because I really want you to understand it. You know, I mean, every, and I've shown you guys recently, but every single feast has been fulfilled. Even, even the Feast of Tabernacles. People that, they go and they, they, they keep the, the Feast of Booths, you know, uh, and they feel like they're doing a great thing. Now, if you want to observe, observe, observe something like that because of a traditional thing and you enjoy doing that, I'm not against that, but I'm just telling you, unless you've entered into Christ, you've not entered into the Feast of Tabernacles. And even the Qumranite community saw that. And I don't agree with a lot of the doctrines that they had there, but they saw that when the Messiah come, you had that he's entering into him would be the Feast of Booths fulfilled. So, anyway, let's continue on. Though. This is so beautiful to me. Let's start with verse uh, 10. Pick back, we'll pick up a little, okay. By the which we, we will, we, excuse me, by the which will we are sanct, uh, sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. And every priest that stand, priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices, sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But this man, after he offered once sac one sacrifice for the sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God from henceforth, expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Whereof the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us, for after that he had said before, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts and into their minds will I write them. And their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Now where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. Let's stop on that note. Verse 18, this verse right here is what caught my heart. This is the one that I realized that God kept having me read this over and over and over until I found it. You know, you can see the words and not get the revelation of it. And it's not that I didn't know this, but there was just something that pulled my heart. Now where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. The importance of this is like in the case of the article here that I brought up of a very, you know, longtime friend of mine. I won't mention names. But he had done a video with Yehuda Glick just recently on national television, aired all over the United States, um, as well as on his YouTube channel. And in his defense, I will say that he told me later that if I had not used Yehuda Glick's version where it was cut he claimed that if you go on there he also stood for christ being the fulfillment of this ministry however though when he was with yehuda glick he clearly was standing the opposite in the fulfillment of this happening with the building of the third temple and even as a damage control 
I, I shared with him that, you know, brother, listen. You know, I appreciate Rabbi Glick, his wife, what they're doing for the fatherless, for the widows, because they quoted Isaiah 1. That that had to be done before the temple could come into being re rebuilt, the third temple. I said, but what about the oppressed? See, in that video, there was no mention of the oppressed. And I said, because the Palestinians are the oppressed. The neighbors, there's love thy neighbor as thyself. That's totally forgotten. But to do a damage control, he got in touch with Yehuda Glick. Caught him at a, at a wedding. And Yehuda Glick began to speak about how that, uh, oh, we treated the wounded from Syria free of charge. Anybody that ever watches Israeli News Live, if you go back and look on my broadcast, when Israel was treating the wounded, it was Al-Qaeda and Al-Nusra. They call them Syrians? They're not Syrians, they're, they're terrorists. They were killing Christians, beheading Christians. That's who Israel was treating. That's not loving your neighbor as yourself. As Sipi Livni, who uh, was the for, uh, former uh, cabinet minister in the Israeli government, also uh, during the Obama uh, years when he was president of the United States there, she was working on the, uh, as one of the uh, framers of the peace agreement then. She said on RT News when the, uh, the, the, the person, uh, the, the lady there that does the broadcast, can't think of her name, was interviewing Sippy Livni, why didn't Israel come and help Russia to overthrow al-Nusra and al-Qaeda? And all these uh, militants that were trying to overthrow Bashar al-Assad, she says, are, she was appalled by the idea. She said, you really think that Israel is going to help them? She said, I, I am appalled that you even suggest that. I'm just paraphrasing her words. But you can go back and listen to it. <laughs> yeah, while the Christians were murdered and slaughtered in Syria, the only ones that Israel cared for were those that were doing the slaughtering. All right? And as far as the Palestinians, you can go back and listen to our interview with, uh, um, oh goodness, his name slips my mind right now. He's an Israeli. His uh, sister, uh, she... Her daughter was killed by a suicide bomber in Israel. And, uh, and we had him on. Uh, I, I forget the name right now. Maybe I'll put it in the little section there for you as I'm speaking about it. But anyway, uh, we had him on. And he will tell you just how evil the Palestinians are treated. And, you know... I don't say that, that, you know, and when I say this, understand, there, there are a lot of secular Jews that care about the Palestinians. We interviewed a, a lady and her daughter uh, who needed, wanted to remain anonymous, but shared their love for the Palestinian people. So there are Jewish people that do care, but as a whole, no, there, that just doesn't exist. So anyway, it says here, Isaiah 2, 3, and the many people shall go and say, come, let us go up to the Mount of uh, the Lord, to the house of God of Jacob, that he may instruct us in his ways and we may walk in his paths for the instruction shall come forth from Zion, the word of uh, Hashem from Jerusalem, Isaiah 2, 3, or the word of the Lord, right? Now, <laughs> what gets me is that the interview that I was watching, good friend of mine, you know, somebody I, I love dearly, but I, I, I'm watching go right over the cliff Scripture that was fulfilled 2,000 years ago when Jesus Christ came there and, the, and they came and said even when on the day of Pentecost all the nations had the, the, the children of the house of Israel coming in you know uh, I'll show it to you maybe it's your first time on, on this channel so let me, let, me, let me show you I don't want to leave nobody hanging uh, and this will air on Danoon Institute, uh, maybe the next day or so. It'll air over on Israeli News Live as well. Um, Book of Acts, chapter 2. You know, you'll find many of these prophecies you'll see fulfilled, right, in the Book of Acts. Now, of course, Jesus coming, fulfilling those, being in the temple, things like that. He had, and he did come from these. He came from the Mount of Olives. 
Uh, in fact, if you look at the Hebrew Matthew on that, I don't have it up here right now, but on, in the Hebrew Matthew, that's how you know where the, uh, the Roman uh, garrison was. Because some people say, oh, no, 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 that's, that wasn't the Temple Mount. Well, no, I agree with the, the people in Israel. Do, they, they say that was the Temple Mount. Roddy Brown, good friend of mine, we did a video on that. It is where the Temple stood. That's where the Romans destroyed it. And that Roman garrison, according to the Hebrew Matthew, was actually over on the Mount of Olives. I actually found that. I shared that before. I don't have time to go into it right now. But anyway, um, right here, verse 36, Acts chapter 2. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. So the house of Israel from all those different nations had come back. And speaking in all their different tongues, not only were they, uh, they, they say they're actually in the Greek language, they say Jews, but they translated Jews. They were not Jews, they're Judeans. But they spoke all those other languages. They're, here it is right here. Perithians, Medes, Elamites, dwellers of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, right? Egypt, I'm skipping some of them, Cyrene, strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes. So both Jew and Gentile were dwelling there in Jerusalem when they heard this great, amazing thing because what? We found that the, uh, the Spirit of God had came down like a Russian mighty wind and had filled the 120 uh, which were from the house of Judah that were, that were uh, there in the upper room filled with the Holy Ghost and they came out stammering. Uh, and they were filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews or Judeans, devout men out of every nation under heaven. So this is when all this great movement was going on. And even when Jesus was on the earth, what did you have? You had people from Syria coming. You had, you know, his, his fame was spreading abroad everywhere. And then they had Jesus sent out the 70. They went out to abroad. And, and so his fame was spreading everywhere. And people were coming to see him. All right. Now, go back over here to the book of Hebrews here. So we have in there, and their sins and iniquities are remember no more. That's what really gets me there. Now, where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. So what is this fulfilling when it says, and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more? Well, Jeremiah 31 is one of the places it's quoting from. And I want to share that with you. But this verse 32, Jeremiah 31, verse 32. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days. Saith the Lord. Notice, the house of Israel. Thus, excuse me, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their what? Inward parts. Okay, that, that means right there, okay, Israel, okay, after, I'm not highlighting it right there, all right, after those days, excuse me, Chachem, Neum Yehovah, that also, by the way, is another way that, is, that, is, that can be translated a lot of times as latter days. Natati et toti mekabam. Okay? And I will give my law be kabam in their inward parts. Same, similar to betoch, right? And I will, and in their heart will I write it, okay? The al labam, okay? And as he does there, then he says, and I will be their God. Vehiti lehem le Elohim, and they shall be my people. But he puts the law in their heart. Christ came to fulfill that by placing the law, his word, within the heart. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, 
for they shall all know me from the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord, for I will forgive, watch that, for I will forgive their iniquity and their sin will I remember no more. That's two things right there. I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. Now, this is important, friends. All right? And they shall teach, excuse me, and they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord. What is that? Right there. Talmudic oral law. They shall teach no more every man his neighbor and his, every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord. We won't have Talmudic law. We won't have Aruch Shulchan. We won't have Zohar teachings, uh, Midrash teachings. We won't have that anymore. Once the New Testament, and here it is right here in Hebrew, the Berith Chadashah, mine's getting about broke down now. Once we got the Berith Chadashah came out, the New Testament, that was it. That was the New Covenant. And what did he say? For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin will I remember no more. Now, I had to make a picture of this because I highlighted so many, sorry, so many things at one time to try to get you to see this. That I know, I know how it happens because when you're over here, when you scroll over something, all these little things pop up. Well, on Daniel, it would be popping up everywhere. So what I did is I took and I just took a picture of what I was going to share with you. So I want to show this to you now. Daniel 9 24 we already see Jeremiah 31 is basically telling you what is being fulfilled also in Daniel 9 24 70 weeks are decreed upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression to make an end of sin and to forgive iniquity now to finish transgression and to make an end of sin, that's basically one over here. That's why I did them purple to kind of so you can see what it is written in Hebrew on both sides there. You can look at it. And to forgive iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal the vision and prophet and to anoint the most holy place. All right. But the important thing for us in looking at these prophecies that have already been fulfilled is what I have in purple and yellow there, to finish transgression and to make an end of sin. All right? And to forgive iniquity. Aon is the iniquity. Okay? If you go over here and we look at Jeremiah 31, right? Where I have it in yellow, for I will forgive what? Their iniquity and their sin will I remember no more. Okay? If you spoke Hebrew, it'd probably be easier, but I did highlight that in blue over here for you as well. Uh, it's a little. Um, here's the. Okay, I can't highlight it. All right? There you are right there. There's one of your words. It's a little different when you, when you have it like this because. Um, uh, oh, get it over here, get it right for you. To seal up the video, okay, whoops, sorry. And the sin, I can't highlight it on this one. That, that's what I was kind of hoping to be able to do, but I can't do it. Um, to make an end of sin and to forgive iniquity. All right, this, the own is the iniquity. Okay, and then we have over here for the transgression and sin. Um, keep going to the wrong one. Apologize for that. So, at any rate, no sense to keep going back and forth. We'll just be here all night trying to do this. The point is, is the iniquity and the sin would be remembered no more. Now, let's go all the way back to Ezekiel 43. All right? Jesus fulfilled this. The place of the soles of my feet where I will dwell in the midst of the children of Israel forever. The house of Israel shall no more defile my holy name. And the house of Israel did, they showed right back up, right? Then we look at, um, uh, well, I'll tell you what, I need to look at these other articles so it makes more sense to you as well. So, and by the way, this article here, Evangelical and Latin American Faithful Leaders Gather in Israel's Knesset, 
And what are they doing? They're supporting not only Israel, but the rebuilding of the third temple. Uh, in this article here, they're quoting Zechariah 8.19. We're going to get into that in just a minute too. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the fast of the fourth month and the fast of the fifth month, the fast of the seventh month, the fast of the tenth month shall become occasions for joy and gladness. Happy festivals for the house of Judah, but you must love honesty and integrity. Zechariah 8.19. Okay? But the problem is, these, like Bob O'Dell, and there's another guy in this article here that's uh, from, uh, I think, uh, let's see, Ray Montgomery. They spearheaded this repentance on the ninth of Av, Tish B'Av, to repent. I saw, I think it was Shapira and uh, Mark Biltz also uh, pushing for Christians to go and repent for the sins that were done to Israel what Rome did, and, and so therefore it's the Christians' fault for the destruction of the temple on, the, on, on Tish B'Av in 70 AD. I would never repent for the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. Jesus clearly said to his disciples when they showed him the temple and the buildings that were there, he said, not one stone will be left upon another. Why? Israel had rejected their Messiah. They had rejected the very temple that God dwelt in. This is why when we look at these scriptures and I say they're already fulfilled and, you, and it's maybe a little confusing. We sit there and we read right here, you know, all right. Uh, you know, the place of the souls, let's see, back up a little bit. And the glory of the Lord, or Ukavod Yehovah came into the house by the way of the gate whose prospect is toward the east. And people say, well, wait a minute. And Jesus came in by the way of the east. Who do you think was dwelling inside of Jesus Christ? It was none other than God himself. He was the temple. He walked up through the eastern gate onto the temple mount inside the temple. He was the temple. All right, so these things are already being fulfilled. We get over here to Zechariah. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of getting things out of, mixed up out of here. So let me go back. All right. So, so therefore, they're quoting this. Bob, you know, these guys here, they started this new repentance thing, thinking this is going to help bring redemption and bring the Messiah. Messiah's already come. He's already fulfilled all these scriptures. Okay? Maybe before I go there, let me jump back to Hebrews here. So now where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. Now they're, they're talking about bringing in redemption. They're talking about building the third temple. And friends of mine, supposed to be friends, but I can see they're going completely, I mean, it's almost like they're going into apostasy. You know, I mean, oh yeah, they'll admit, oh yeah, I know the Antichrist is going to come and take over. No, the Antichrist is going to build it. It is a beast system. Jesus wounded the head of that serpent when he revealed who the Pharisees really were. Oh, they tried to do damage control on that one too, and they tried to tell you, oh no, Ezra, when Ezra was here, Ezra made them put away their wives, put, you know, put the children out from in their midst there, and, and uh, that was the end of it. God forgave them for their sins. Well, I'll tell you one thing, they ended up going to Israel when the children of Israel went back. They went anyway. They might not have been living with, with uh, uh, daddy priest, but they certainly went there because by the time Christ came on the scene, they had overtaken the priesthood and threw out the true priest and they were living down in Qumran. Jesus said they were serpents. It, and, and that's exactly what it says. They had mingled the seed. They were reptilian. All right, so... You know, you take it out with Jesus. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter in the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. Having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience 
and our bodies washed in pure water, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promise. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. This is where it gets serious. That's why I'm, that's why I'm kind of bringing this, going back into these issues, right? Not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together. The writer of the book of Hebrews knew when this would happen in our day. He knew the fulfillment would already be taking place in the earlier part of chapter 10. But he also knew there would come a time where you would begin to forsake the assembly. All right? And uh, I normally bash the 501c pastors because they're the biggest ones that are forsaking the assembly. Now, the pastor that I spoke about here publicly recently reminded me that he's not 501c3. Part of his ministry is not. Now, the church where his father has is 501c3. But, and I do appreciate that, that, that he's not as far as the other part. But the thing is, they still practice not assembling themselves together. As the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, so much the more as you see the day approaching. Here's where it gets real serious though. For if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. What is the knowledge of the truth? It was the message of Jesus Christ. That he was what? That what is the knowledge of the truth? He is the sacrifice for sins. The building of the third temple is bringing back animal sacrifices from day one. They build that third temple, there will be sacrifices offered into it. So don't tell me that it is going to be built for a good purpose as a, as a, a, a place, a house of prayer. The sacrifices are being offered even before they get it built. And there are Christians that actually go to that and uh, are, are part of it. Participate even. And he clearly tells you, right? Clearly. If we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. You embrace the building of the third temple. I don't care if you say you know that the Antichrist will take over it. The moment you embrace it and you are there and you help in the consecration of the building of the third temple, you will have no more sacrifice for your sins. You have rejected Jesus Christ and as it says, but a certain fearful looking for judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. How much sore punishment suppose you shall be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God and counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified in an unholy thing and done despite under the Spirit of grace. That's why I'm hammering this so hard. You know, it's not that I, I don't hate my brothers or sisters, whichever it may be, that are out there that preach these things that stand, you know, because I mean, look, I was standing with Israel as well. In fact, at one time I had a Facebook page that said, unconditionally we stand with Israel. You know, very much, very Zionist in nature in that way. So I realize it's easy to get caught up into a lie and go in the wrong direction, but what I'm trying to get you to understand, you don't have to be like that. Get away from those ungodly things. Separate yourselves. Because the time may be too late. You don't want to cross that line. And you've got, you've got, you've got right here in yellow, for if we send, wait a minute, uh, sorry, back up. Not forsaking the assembly. He gave you the very thing you needed to see. Very thing. You needed to see is when the timeline would be for, when that would be coming. All right? So they want you to repent on the Tishbaab. Let me show you on that one there then.
This one I've been dealing with because of uh, Mark Biltz and Yitzhak Shapira. Not that particular scripture that they quote there in the article uh, on the uh, Tish B'Av issue there, but if you go back and look at it, they're quoting uh, Zechariah 8 and 19. All right, in Zechariah 8, 17, let none of you devise evil in your hearts against his neighbor. And love no false oath for all these things, thing are, these are, the, are things that I hate, saith the Lord. Israel on a regular basis devising evil against their neighbors. And the word of the Lord of hosts came unto me, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, The fast of the fourth month, the fast of the fifth, and the fast of the seventh, and the fast of the tenth shall be the house of Judah joy and gladness and cheerful season. Therefore love ye truth and peace. Jesus Christ is truth, and he was our shalom, our peace. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, so when is, it, when is Israel's mourning and fasting going to turn to joy? Well, let's see what the scripture says. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, it shall yet come to pass that there shall come peoples and the inhabitants of many cities. Inhabitants of one city shall go to another, saying, Let us go speedily to entreat the favor of the Lord and to seek the Lord of hosts, and I will go also. Yea, many peoples and mighty nations shall come to seek the Lord of hosts in Jerusalem to entreat the favor of the Lord. Ministers putting this in the future. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, In those days it shall come to pass that ten men shall take hold out of all the languages of the nations. All right? Now, I, 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 for me, it's like a conjecture on the ten men issue. Israel has had this thing under Talmudic teaching that when Abraham sought God that if there were ten righteous in the city, would you spare it for the sake of ten? I've kind of held it that this is one of the this is where that got started from. The ten shall take hold out of all the languages of the nation, shall even take hold of the skirt of him that is a Jew, saying, We will go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. Now, granted, as Yitzhak Shapira says, we hear that God is with you, right? Because Shemanu, Ki Shemanu, Elohim Im Cham. We hear God is with you. Jesus was called Emmanuel. God is with us. When it says here, take hold of the wing of him that is a Jew, it says, Bikanaf Ish Yehudi. Take a hold of the wing of a Jewish man, singular. And that was fulfilled, friends, in Jesus Christ. He was that Jewish man. And we can actually find in the Hebrew Matthew that it actually says when Jesus was up around Galilee that they came to him from all the regions including that of Syria and they took a hold of his kanaf. It says in the Hebrew, his kanaf. Now, to show you the difference, the woman that was sick that said, if yet I can only touch the hem of his garment, I'll be made well. In the Hebrew Matthew, it says his tzitzit. Huh. Ten men shall take all out of all the languages of the nations. Well, let's go look back at Acts again. Right? And what do we have? How hear, me, hear we every man in our own tongue? Wherein we were what? Born. All right? Wherein we were born. Perithians, Medes, Elamites. And back up just a little bit. When, when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. Notice, there's a space of time that we're not looking at. Right? Now, when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together. Maybe it didn't happen right that second. There were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, and that's actually Judeans in the Greek language, devout men out of every nation under heaven. 
Then it says, now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. Then we find out that they were Mesopotamians, Parthians, Medes, Elamites, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, parts of Libya, Cyrene, strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes, Cretes, Arabians. Wow. Seemed like from the whole known world at that time. We do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. Now, see, that's kind of interesting too. They weren't speaking in unknown tongues. They were speaking in the tongues of these people. Or at least they heard in their own language. We just know they were stammering with other tongues. And maybe they were speaking in the very language of that person or that language of that people there. Maybe this group was speaking one another. I don't really know. I have no idea how that was. I just know. They say, we do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. But yet the miracle was that they were all Galileans that were speaking. How, did, how could they do this? So, Zechariah that ten men shall take hold out of all the languages of the nation, shall even take hold of the skirt of him that is a Jew. And how do we know it's fulfilled? See, we hear, we, that's plural, imchem, okay, lemor, okay, it says lemor, nelecha uh, imchem. They said, we will go with you, kishimanu, for we hear that God is with you. But what did they do? They went with them, but they took hold of the wing of him that was a Jew. How did they do it? Well, they asked how they, you know, <laughs> they were all amazed and were in doubt, saying one to another, what meaneth this? And others mocking said, these men are full of new wine. Peter said, stood up in the eleven, lifted up his voice, said unto them, you men of Judea, and all you that dwell in Jerusalem, but be this known unto you, and hearken to my words. These are not drunk as you suppose they are. See, but it's only the third hour of the day. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. See, there's another scripture fulfilled. But it shall come to pass in the last day, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. You'd be surprised how many times they quote that. Ministers of today and say, oh, that's going to be fulfilled in Israel coming up. And after he tells them about all the scriptures that are being fulfilled, and by the way, this whole thing about the moon turns into blood, that was fulfilled back then. Oh, but we're trying to make it all happen today. I guarantee you one thing probably will happen today. And when it does, it won't be like what these guys are telling you now. It'll be something totally different. So they said the sun before the great and notable day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. You know, he's actually quoting you, the scripture. So he says, you men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs which you, God did by him in the midst of you as you yourselves also know. Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by wicked hands of crucified and slain whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible he should be holden of it. For David speaketh concerning him, for I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand, that I should not be moved. Wow. Therefore did my heart rejoice, and my tongue was glad. Moreover also my flesh shall rest in hope, because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life, thou shalt make me full of joy, with thy countenance. There it is. <laughs> Make me full of joy. And you want to know why it says over there? Right there when they quote it? Shall become occasions for joy and gladness. Well, it's fulfilled right there. David saw it's going to be joy, joyful. Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you and pride patriarch David with that he is both dead and buried in his sepulchre is with us to this day. Therefore, 
being a prophet, knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. He's seeing this before, spoke of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. This Jesus has God raised up, wherefore are we are all witnesses. Therefore, by the right hand of God, exalted and having received the Father, the promise of the Holy Ghost, he hath shed for this which you now see and hear. For David is not ascended into the heavens, but he saith himself, The Lord saith unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand until I make thy foes thy footstore. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know surely that God hath made that same Jesus whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. House of Israel. Though Israel be as the house of Israel be as the sand of the sea in multitude, yet only a remnant would return. That was 2,000 years ago fulfilled, friends. Right? Now, when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. There it is. There it is. That is taking a hold of the wing of him that is a Jew. That is the fulfillment of Zechariah. Bekanov, each Yehudi. And then they said, we will go with you. For we hear God is with you. For this promise unto you and your children, to all that are far off, and even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many words did they did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourself from the untoward generation. Ooh, that's a that's powerful. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized the same day there were added unto them about three thousand souls. Friends, I'm seeing it left and right all the time. Especially when you watch this particular media outlet breaking Israel news, quoting scripture, a lot of Christian support out there for this particular group here, but always quoting scriptures that are in most cases have already been fulfilled. There's scripture still to be fulfilled. I realize that. But we're not helping the Jewish people not one single bit by sitting there lying to them, telling them that, oh, all is well and hunky-dory. We'll be right there for you. Listen. This one that you're really going to get yourself in trouble with, ministers, if you're not careful, is that scripture right there, that building of the third temple. I forget where I put it at now. But that one right there, that will sink the ship because there will remain no more sacrifice for sins if you allow that to happen. There will be no more sacrifice for sins. Please, friends, I adjure you in the name of the living God, the Lord Jesus Christ, don't make that mistake, ministers. We thank you for your support of this ministry. And we appreciate your love and your prayers. If you want to visit our website, IsraeliNewsLive.org, please do so. I'll just share the link with you here, IsraeliNewsLive.org. Uh, and everything is here on our website here. If you want to donate, you can. The Noon Institute is the way we do the donation by mail or just clicking online. God bless you and thank you for listening.